Well, many of you will know this painting, but not so many of you know that it was painted by a woman. And that, and that is who I'd like to talk about, Elizabeth Butler, a genteel Victorian lady who almost exclusively painted battle pictures uh, from Waterloo, like this one, Scotland Forever, to the Crimean War, Afghanistan, the Boer War, through and including the First World War. Well, let's start at the very beginning. I'll come back to this one later. And here's Elizabeth. Uh, Elizabeth Thompson was born near Lausanne in 1846. Her sister Alice was born a year later. She became, uh, she married Wilfred Maynell, so became Alice Maynell. Uh, Wilfred Maynell was an Irish poet and she too wrote poetry and uh, journalism. Now their parents were Thomas and Christiana Thompson. They were introduced to each other by Charles Dickens. Thomas was a gentleman of private means. He had inherited a sum of money from his grandfather on condition that he didn't work. So he took to traveling throughout Europe, uh, pursuing his own cultural interests. But this meant that from 1851, the, the two girls spent much of their childhood constantly on the move. And they tended to spend the winter months in Italy, seems like a good idea, and the summers in England. But he didn't own a property in England, so they lived in Kent, the Isle of Wight, Henley, Cheltenham, London, and so on. They didn't go to school. They were educated by their father. He had been to Cambridge. Elizabeth's art education was patchy. At the age of 15, she had oil painting lessons from a Mr. William Standish, and he got her to do copies of Lancia's Horses Heads, and they stood her in good stead. Shortly afterwards, she enrolled at the uh, elementary class of the Female School of Art in South Kensington. But she disliked the um, design orientated syllabus there and soon left. She was given patterns to copy and things like that. And for the next three years, she had no formal training but continued to sketch and paint as the family travelled. Um, here are some early sketches she, she did, and you can see she was already uh, drawing soldiers. In 1866, so now in her 20th year, she returned to the female school of art, this time uh, attending the advanced classes. And she started to have paintings exhibited at the Dudley Gallery in London and the Society of Female Artists. Three years later, we're up to 1869 now, she had lessons in Florence from Giuseppe Bellucci. He would only allow her to paint in monochrome. The following year, she submitted her painting of the Magnificat to the Pope's annual exhibition in Rome. It was accepted. And so the following year, after her final term at the School of uh, Art in South Kensington, she submitted it to the Royal Academy with a certain amount of confidence. If it was good enough for the Pope, surely it was good enough for the Royal Academy. But it was not. The painting was refused. And what was worse, it was, return what was, worse, it was returned to her with a hole in it. The following year, she submitted another painting. But again, it was rejected. Undaunted, the third year she submitted another one, and this one was accepted, but it was skied. Uh, what do I mean by skied? Well, it was hung high up on the wall. Here's a painting of the Royal Academy uh, painted eight years later, and just look how high some of the uh, paintings are. Um, you can see th uh, that arch there. Um, we'll have a close up of the arch. Here we go. You can see just how high some of the paintings were. Well, no one was going to see uh, th that pa her painting. Well, Elizabeth continued to send watercolours to the Dudley Gallery, and one was bought by a Manchester businessman. I have to concentrate here. His name is Charles Galloway. I keep wanting to say George, but I think he was quite a different character. Um, and he commissioned another painting from her, a battle painting. As a woman, she might have chosen to paint something feminine, let's say, what about Lady Richmond's ball on the night before the Battle of Waterloo? No, that had already been done. Elizabeth was made of stronger stuff. She painted a much more sombre scene of Crimea. A roll call was submitted to the Royal Academy 
and accepted. Success at last. What's more, it was hung on the line at eye level. Charles Galloway was so pleased with it that he increased the payment for it from £100 to £126. Well, it doesn't sound very much. It equates to about 8000 today. It's more than I get for mine. At the banquet on the opening night, the Prince of Wales praised the painting. And following his speech, crowds thronged around the picture, so many that uh, a policeman had to be uh, stationed in front of it to protect it and the paintings on either side. And that had only happened twice before. This is an image depicting the courage of the British soldiers, painted in sombre colours, an example of understated emotion. Elizabeth wanted to ensure that the picture was historically accurate. The models she used were mostly ex-soldiers. The model for the sergeant calling the role had actually seen service in Crimea. Well, let's have a, a closer look at the pictures if we were in a gallery going up close. And here we have, we have a young soldier looking vacant is that shell shock or PDSD that we'd call it now. Another one, another guardsman is consoling a fellow soldier with his head in his arms, another bandaging his own wrist, and still another exhausted leaning on a fellow guardsman. The picture was taken to Windsor for the Queen to view. Florence Nightingale, now bedridden, asked for the picture to be taken to her bedside. Many people wanted to buy the picture, including the Prince of Wales. But Galloway refused them all, that is, until the Queen said that she would like it. The Queen was so delighted with the painting that she gave Elizabeth a diamond bracelet, and the painting remains in the Royal Collection today. Galloway insisted that Elizabeth paint another picture for him. The reviewers suggested that Elizabeth's success was a one-off, but it was not. For the following year, Elizabeth produced her next battle painting, this time of Waterloo. Here we have the 28th North Gloucestershire Regiment at Catarabra on the 16th of June, 1815, so prior to the actual battle, as it formed a square to receive the last charge of Marshal Ney's cavalry and the Polish lancers. Now, Elizabeth went to great lengths to achieve an accurate interpretation of the action. She read accounts of the battle. She saw King Lake's model of the battle. She read that the 28th had formed a square in a field of particularly tall rye. So she went off in search of a field of rye. She visited Henley in July 1874, and there she actually bought a field of rye. And with the help of local children, she trampled it down just to get the effect of that uh, corner there, the left-hand corner, the trampled down rye grass in the foreground. For the horses, she visited Sanger's Circus, where two horses were made to lie down and flounder while she sketched them for the horse in the right foreground. Elizabeth said, this is my Elizabeth voice, I wish to show what an English square looks like viewed quite close at the end of two hours of action when about to receive the last charge. The painting was accepted by the Royal Academy, but this time it was hung in the lecture room, a dark room nicknamed the Black Hole. But when Elizabeth visited the exhibition, she wrote that she saw a dense, surging multitude before my picture. There were so many people looking at it, she couldn't even see it. The reviewers appreciated the historical accuracy that Elizabeth had gone to such pains to achieve. Even John Ruskin was impressed. John Ruskin, the great art critic of the time, he said, my John Ruskin voice, I never approached a picture with more iniquitous prejudice against it than I did Miss Thompson's, partly because I've always said that no woman could paint. No, I wouldn't get on with him. And secondly, because what I because I thought what the public made such a fuss about must be good for nothing. But it is Amazon's work, this, no doubt about it. And the first fine pre-Raphaelite picture of the battle we have had. Praise indeed. So back to Elizabeth. Here she is. Here's a photo that was taken of her. This was taken in Regent Street. 250,000 copies 
of that photo were sold. So why did this genteel Victorian lady choose to paint battle scenes? Why not pretty little cottages like Helen Allingham or cute children like Helen Greenway, both fellow students at South Kensington? Well, I've been studying Elizabeth since 2006, and there's nowhere does she say or anyone else say I painted battle pictures because but there were various events in her life that may have influenced her decision. At the age of 14, she had saw Garibaldi, uh, the revolutionary leader, on the day before he landed in Sicily, along with his supporters, the Garibaldini. When she returned to England, she wrote that the volunteer movement was in full swing. And the artist right was, of course, were formed in 1859. But on her 19th birthday, her birthday treat, the, the family took her to visit Waterloo, Balaclava. This picture depicts the remnants of the Light Brigade returning from that disastrous charge during the Battle of Balaclava. The 24th of October, 1854, as a result of a misinterpretation of orders, a force of 660 British cavalry led by Lord Cardigan was reduced to 195 in just 20 minutes. Now Elizabeth chose not to depict the charge of the Light Brigade as commemorated in Tennyson's poem, Riding into the Valley of Death. But instead she concentrated on the suffering of the soldiers. Again, she went to great effort to accurately portray the soldiers. An old sergeant of the 17th Lancers lent her his uniform. And Sergeant Major George Lloyd Smith of the 11th Hussars modeled for the bearded troop sergeant. And the actor W.H. Pennington posed as a central figure. He had been, uh, in, he, <coughs> excuse me, himself had been a trooper in, in the 11th Prince Albert's own Hussars. Sadly, he created the only real criticism of the picture. It was too theatrical, said the critics, and she recounts in her autobiography the trouble she had with him. But apart from that, the picture was well received. It was exhibited at the private gallery of the Fine Arts Society. The gallery charged a shilling to see it. The picture proved to be very popular. It toured the country. By the time it reached Liverpool in January 1877, 100,000 people had seen it. Elizabeth continued to lead the life of a young woman of her class. She did the season, adding, uh, attending various social events, dinners, dances, and so on. Her mother hosted at homes on Wednesdays. Ruskin came, so did William Powell Frith. She had dinner with the Millays. Tissot was there. She went to the Lord Mayor's banquet with her father. And at a lunch, she met Major William Butler, the man who was to become her husband. But as soon as the season came to a close, she was back at work on her next picture and went back to Crimea with the return from Inkerman. Now the battle had been won largely by the courage and determination of the men through hours of fighting. And this is what she wanted to show, those same soldiers after the battle. So here we have a ragged column of exhausted and wounded men as they trudge back to the camp from the heights of Inkerman on the 5th of November 1854. They were mostly Coldstream Guards and 20th of Foot, the Lancashire Fusiliers. In 1877, Elizabeth Thompson married Major William Butler. William Butler was a Catholic Irishman from a, uh, a, an impoverished family who'd made his way in the army without any help or influence. He was commissioned, here he is, a, as a young ensign into the 69th Regiment, the South Lincolnshires. His early service just reads like a boy's own adventure story. He'd already served in Burma, India, Canada, West Africa, South Africa, by the time of their marriage. Here he is as a major. Now Elizabeth gives us, there was no Hello magazine in those days. Um, she gives us very uh, little detail about her relationship with Major Butler in her autobiography. And he gives none in his. He merely says, 1877 was the year of my marriage. 
He doesn't say to whom or give us any other detail at all. Full stop, new paragraph. Elizabeth merely records that on the 3rd of March, she was engaged to be married to the author of The Great Lone Land. Now, that was the book he wrote recounting his arduous journey through the Canadian Northwest on a horseback, dog sled and, and foot. They married in June 1877. Cardinal Manning conducted the service. They honeymooned in Ireland. William had been brought up in Tipperary. Now, though she painted this later, it shows the beauty of the landscape of Ireland where they honeymooned. And there she began her first painting as a married woman. Listed for the Connaught Rangers. Well, not an actual battle scene, but still with a military theme. It shows two Irish recruits being marched out of the Glen by a recruiting sergeant, followed by a private and two drummer boys of the 88th Regiment, the Connaught Rangers. The recruit on the left looks back at the ruined house. Is that his house? Or did he come from a similar one? The recruits are shown in a kind of national dress of a jacket with long homespun sleeves and black hats. As the wife of an army officer, Elizabeth was now required to follow her husband as he was posted around Britain and abroad. It was not long before she fell pregnant, but sadly she lost her first child, Mary Patricia. William took her abroad to aid her recovery. They went to Lourdes and then on to Switzerland. However, in the ensuing years, she went on to have five more children. William's next posting was to South Africa, to Durban. War was looming in Zululand. Left behind, Elizabeth began work on an eight-foot canvas of the Afghan war. This immensely sad picture commemorates one of the worst disasters of British military history. Very briefly, Britain believed that the Russians were planning to invade India through Afghanistan. The British Governor General in India, Lord Auckland, ordered the East India Company army into Afghanistan under the command of General Elphinstone, who by then was 60 years of age. There, the British found the rugged mountainous, mountainous terrain harsh and inhospitable. They were continually attacked by Afghan tribesmen, but eventually managed to reach Kabul. But once there, the force was attacked again. And finally, a retreat was negotiated with Akbar Khan. But he broke his word. The army was repeatedly attacked as it retreated along the 60 miles of snow-covered passes to the fort at Jalalabad. When Dr. William Bryden, shown here, an assistant surgeon in the Bengal army, arrived alone at the gates of, his, of Jalalabad, it was thought that he was the sole survivor of a force of 16,500 soldiers and camp followers. A few others eventually struggled through to the fort. Punch magazine declared this as the picture of the year. Other reviewers commentated on the details, the broken knees and bloodshot eyes of the pony, and the way the wounded surgeon clings to the saddle to prevent himself from falling. The Royal Academy exhibited both her Afghan picture and the recruitment of the Connaught Rangers in 1879. Elizabeth was delighted to be welcomed back to the Royal Academy. Here's the full picture. Oh, sorry, no, it's not. Remnants of the army have been likened to Jean-Louis Bessonnier's painting, which I'm going to show you now, <laughs> uh, depicting Napoleon riding at the head of his army as they retreated from uh, Leon in 1814. I don't see much similarity, but the reason I'm showing it to you is that in the second half of the 19th century, Bessonnier was generally considered to be the greatest of all battle painters. And so Elizabeth was delighted when Massonnier was quoted as having said, he said it in French, of course, I'll just stick to the English. England really has only one military painter, a woman. So praise indeed. Well, back to Elizabeth again. 
There was talk about her being uh, elected to the Royal Academy. The rules of the Academy didn't bar women members. There just hadn't been any. The election was made up of three ballots. Elizabeth lost by two votes in the last ballot, and she was never nominated again. But this is where up to 1879, it took till 1936 for, the, for there to be a woman Royal Academy, Academician named Laura Knight. Well, in the autumn of 1879, Elizabeth began work on Scotland Forever. But work on it was delayed and she received a royal commission. The Queen wanted a painting for the current military action. Elizabeth had never painted a current conflict before. The Queen wanted a picture of Rourke's Drift, the attack by Zulus on a hospital base. Well, the defence of the mission station, the station at Rourke's Drift was one of the few redeeming features of the Zulu War of 1879. The afternoon of the 22nd of January, the garrison, made up of 84 men of the 2nd Battalion, the 24th 2nd Warwickshire Regiment, later to become the South Wales Borderers, so 84 fit infantrymen, 36 hospital cases, and a few others, under the command of Lieutenant Chard Royal Engineers, was attacked by 4,000 Zulu warriors. Elizabeth had great difficulty finding any Zulus, Zulu warriors in London. Uh, she found one uh, black actor, and so she's just given the impression uh, of the uh, warriors approaching. Despite a succession of Zulu assaults, assaults on the mission, the attackers were repulsed. And after about 12 hours of fighting, the enemy retired. But for this engagement, 11 Victoria Crosses were awarded, the highest number for any single engagement. The picture was accepted by the Royal Academy, but was placed in the lecture room where her quatre bra had been hung. But this time there were no crowds. The reviewers accused it of being theatrical. And true, I, I, I have to agree, I think it is her weakest picture. But in her defence, she had to get those 11 VC winners in uh, so that everyone would be able to recognise them. In 1879, she returned to Waterloo with this vedette of the Scots Greys. Meanwhile, in 1880, uh, William had been posted to Devonport. Elizabeth was now an army commander's wife and mother. Her daughter, also called Elizabeth, had been born in 1879. At Devonport, her first son, Patrick, was born, followed by Richard and Eileen. But she still found time to paint. She restarted work on Scotland forever. And at Devonport, she wrote that she had any amount of grey army horses as models. So this painting may have started as a study for the full picture. And here it is perhaps her most famous painting, depicting the charge by the Scots Greys at the Battle of Waterloo. In her search for accuracy, she watched the Scots Greys charging during training exercises. And then she stood in front to see the effect as two troopers charged her, riding full tilt at her, pulling up within just two yards of where she stood, covering her in dust. Afterwards, she commented, one cannot, of course, stop too long to see them close. I don't think I would have stood there at all. She was determined to give a realistic effect of the Scots Greys charging uh, at the French infantry at Waterloo. And of course, it was during the ensuing melee that uh, Sergeant uh, Ewart captured the eagle from the uh, French 45th Regiment, the Invincibles. In 1882, her husband was posted to Egypt as a lieutenant colonel. Elizabeth stayed behind in Devonport with the children. Uh, her daughter Elizabeth was not yet three, Patrick was two, and she was pregnant with Richard. William returned home in the June of 1885, deeply hurt at the failure to rescue Gordon, but he went back to Egypt in the September. Meanwhile, Elizabeth continued to paint. 
And here's a picture she did. Those of you with very good eyesight will see that it's right at the bottom. It says 1925. And this is because the original picture that she did um, in 1884 uh, was lost probably during one of their moves. So she repainted it exactly uh, the same. And this is a better version of it. This reflects an incident that William recounted to Elizabeth had just before the Battle of Guinness, in which he was uh, leading a brigade. They were out in the desert. The moon was full. The dervishes were sniping at long range. And when they heard in the distance a highland lament, the Cameron Highlanders approached, bearing the body of an officer who died earlier that day of a fever, his body covered in a Union Jack. And this is what she's depicted. In November 1885, Elizabeth set off to join William in Cairo, taking with her two of the children. She loved Egypt. Uh, here's a sketch from uh, her book of their time there. They travelled widely. Uh, this is the boat they sailed in, the Fostad. They sailed up the Nile, they went to Luxor, Aswan, Philly, Nubia. But in July 1886, William Butler was invalided home from his post in Egypt. And the Butler family went to live in an old farmhouse in Brittany, in Dinan. Here's a picture she painted there. Now, why would they go to France? Well, the move was made in order to avoid the publicity of a notorious high society divorce, Campbell versus Campbell, in which William was cited as one of the four co-respondents of the Duchess of Argyle. William Butler refused to testify at the trial. It was held in November and December of 1886. Uh, reports of, of the case were reported in the papers each day. Public opinion was outraged. It was suggested that his refusal to testify proved his guilt. It was a difficult time for them both. But strangely, Elizabeth doesn't refer to it in her autobiography, merely saying that they went to live in an old farmhouse in Brittany to give the children the habit of talking French. And not so strangely, Elizabeth uh, William doesn't refer to it at all in his autobiography. Well, here's the picture that she did there. Now, the scandal didn't seem to damage William too much, for in 1888, he was knighted. And it didn't seem to damage their marriage too much either, as their third son, Martin, was born whilst they were in France. But Elizabeth still found time to paint. Producing this picture, it shows the French dragoons uh, during the Franco-Prussian War. Incidentally, this picture was sold uh, in uh, 2015 at uh, Christie's and it was sold for 48,000. I went to have a look at it, but I didn't buy it. Uh, from France, they went to live in Ireland, where Elizabeth finally chose to paint a non military topic. Now, this painting is at University College Dublin. Uh, it's a wonderful painting. Um, it's, they clearly don't think very much of it because they put it in the admin, uh, in a corridor in the admin department of the folk uh, department of the university. Um, so it's difficult to get a good picture of it, um, but up close it's very good. You can see um, she's standing barefoot in front of her house, which has been burnt to the ground. There's some furniture lying in, in a rubble, a chair, a table, cooking pot. In the background, her husband has been marched off by the militia. Evicted highlighted the conditions of the rural poor and the picture was based on an incident that she'd actually witnessed. Elizabeth visited Egypt four times from 1890. She returned home in June each year when it got too hot, uh, and then she went back again in the November. Whilst there, they took a nine-day cruise along the newly opened Suez Canal, opened in 1869. They admired the engineering feat of the canal, but she wrote that she was dismayed at the miserable villages and the forlorn land they passed through. In April 1891, she and Sir William travelled to their Holy Land in Palestine. 
is a picture of the gardens of Gethsemane taken from her book, Letters from the Holy Land. Both she and her husband loved visiting the places and sites that they knew so well from their Bible. Therefore, faith was important to them both. In 1891, she looked back to Napoleon's campaign in Spain as the earliest uh, conflict that she recorded. This shows uh, uh, the gun team of the RHA, Royal Horse Artillery, carrying wounded soldiers during Sir John Moore's retreat to Corona in the winter of 1808-9. She sent it back to England for exhibition. It was well placed at the Academy, but it didn't sell. She thought perhaps it was too sad a subject. As she had done with the Scots Grace, she watched the charge head on. Again, she stood in front as they charged, as 300 camels charged. So you can't fault her courage. She worked on the picture in, uh, in Ireland and then took it back to Egypt to finish it in oil. Here's the finished picture in oils. It was hung at the Royal Academy in 1893, but it didn't find a buyer. In fact, she kept that picture right uh, for the rest of her life, right to the very end. In November 1893, Sir William was posted to Aldershot. Elizabeth wrote in her autobiography, it's a far cry from Cairo to Aldershot. I know just the feeling. At Aldershot, she and her husband developed a friendship with Empress Eugenie, the widow of Napoleon III, and of course the mother of the Prince Imperial who was killed during the Zulu war Wars. Rather. Three years later, uh, Sir William, now a Major General, was posted to Dover, where she began to study the fifes and drums. This shows the drummer boys of the 57th West Middlesex Regiment waiting under fire for the order to advance during the Peninsula War at the Battle of Albuera on the 16th of May, 1811, some of whom used to be about 10 years old. I know she used her own sons as models. In 1898, Sir William was posted to South Africa. Left behind, Elizabeth began her next painting, still focusing on the Peninsula War she produced on the morrow of Talavera, showing soldiers of the 43rd Regiment, the Oxford Light Infantry. This depicts the aftermath of the first great victory of the Peninsular War on the Spanish soil by the British Army under the direction of Lieutenant General, the Honourable Sir Arthur Wellesley, later of course to become the Duke of Wellington. The soldiers are shown carrying an injured bugler. You can see the bugle lying on his torso. In the background, Wellington is saluting him. The Iron Duke's sympathy with soldiers was well known, and this picture shows that. Her next painting was a commission from the Scots Guards. We're back to uh, Crimea here. This illustrates a famous incident at the Battle of Alma on the 20th of September, 1854, during the Crimean War. When under fire from the Russians, Captain Lindsay stood firm with the regimental colours which were shot through and the staff broken. Sir William had been posted to South Africa as Commander-in-Chief and High Commissioner during the absence of Sir Alfred Milner. In this capacity, he tried to avert a war and to alert the government to their inadequacy of their preparations. William's attitude did not go down well. Elizabeth went to join him in South Africa with three of the children. The two eldest boys were at school. William's efforts to prevent a war were unsuccessful. Instead, he was accused of pro boer sympathies and he was forced to resign his command in September 1899. The war began the following month. They returned to England and Sir William took command of Western District, and so it was back to Devonport. Where William was vilified in the press, and Elizabeth wrote that she intercepted the vilest anonymous letters. At Devonport, she was busy in her role as the wife of commander, receiving various official visitors, but nevertheless continued to paint. 
including this picture of a dispatch rider riding under fire from marksmen galloping across the veldt was well placed at the academy but despite the topicality of the subject it was poorly reviewed in the 1903 royal academy exhibition i think partly because of who her husband was in 1905 she exhibited a painting of the second afghan war is this a sort to represent the action at May Wand on the 18th of, uh, 18th of July, sorry, 1880, uh, when the British Army was forced to retreat from the Afghan force under the covering fire of the RHA? Again, Elizabeth doesn't show the actual battle, but the rescue of the wounded soldiers. In October 1905, Hone reached the age of 67, so William was placed on the retired list. Very image of a proper major general. They returned to Ireland. They lived at Bancha Castle in County Tipperary, where Sir William was made a member of the Irish Privy Council and was also a supporter of the Home Rule movement. He died five years later in 1910, age 72. He's been a man of great personal charm, champion of the weak and oppressed, a talented author of nearly 20 books, how he found the time, but they, the books reflected his love of adventure. And he'd been Elizabeth's husband for 33 years. He was buried at Kilardrick in County Tipperary. And there's an inscription on the wall of the cemetery. The following year, she attended her son Richard's ordination as a priest in Rome. In 1914, the First World War began. Elizabeth painted a series of khaki pictures. Here's one of her watercolours, showing a column of infantry and a horse-drawn ambulance passing a roadside cavalry. It depicts men returning from the front. Her own sons all served in the war. Her eldest son, Patrick, was ADC to General Kappa, commander of the 7th Division. Richard, the priest, became an army chaplain and Martin was attached to the Royal, uh, Second Royal Irish. This was a war that was too close for comfort for any mother. Patrick was severely wounded at Ypres in 1915. Richard had a narrow escape at the Battle of Flanders. He was tending wounded and dying soldiers with Father Knapp. The old priest told him to go and get some rest. But when he returned, he found a shell had hit the priest. In 1917, she painted a picture of an action in Libya. Here she shows the Dorset Yeomanry galloping across the desert with swords drawn, charging the Zanussi tribesmen. They're armed with machine guns. Elizabeth's last exhibited painting was this one a retreat from Mons, showing a squadron of weary, wounded soldiers retreating from the action, their faces <coughs> reflecting the drama they've undergone. Just a close-up of it. This was her last exhibit at the Royal Academy. She had exhibited a total of 24 pictures at the Royal Academy. Not bad for a woman who couldn't paint. After the armistice, Lady Butler continued to live at Bancha Castle in County Tipperary. This is where Bancha Castle. Uh, she continued to paint. She painted in that turret on the right hand side. But in 1922, this frail, deaf widow of a great supporter of the Irish Home Rule movement had her house sequestered by the Republicans. She was forced to leave. She left all her belongings and walked out and went to live with her younger daughter, Eileen, who by now was Viscount Gormanston, and they lived at Gormanston Castle in County Meath. As a woman, she had never witnessed a battle. Elizabeth Butler died at Gormanston Castle on the 2nd of October, 1933, in her 87th year. She was buried at the nearby village of Stamulham, her obituary in the Times included a quotation summing up her attitude to her subject matter. Thank God 
I never painted for the glory of war, but to portray its pathos and heroism. If I had ever seen a corner of a real battlefield, I could never have painted another war picture. <laughs>